everyone. I'm Brian Reynolds, the Chancellor with the Archdiocese of Louisville. Welcome to our podcast series, What's New in Arch Lou? This show highlights the people and ministries of the Archdiocese of Louisville, the Catholic Church in Central Kentucky. Join us each month as we welcome guests to discuss what's new in the Archdiocese and invite you to get involved as you deepen your engagement with your Catholic faith. This program is brought to you by the Arch Lou Podcast Network. One more time, we have a great show ahead of us today with two special guests. I get to have wonderful people to be part of these podcasts, and this time is no exception. We welcome Father Clyde Cruz and Tim Toms. Father Clyde is a retired priest of the Archdiocese and is our, hear this title, Emeritus Archdiocesan Historian. He'll tell you about that in a minute. Father Clyde was the professor of theology at Bellarmine University for 34 years as well as serving in many other roles in, at the university and in the community. In addition to writing many books, Clyde is the author of the history of the Archdiocese. It's entitled An American Holy Land. Tim joined the staff of the Archdiocese in 2019 and is our archivist. Uh, he is a member of the Cathedral of the Assumption and is a dedicated volunteer at his parish. Now, Tim has been part of many things over the years in, in the local church, but having him uh, as our first full-time archivist has been a real gift. So, welcome, Father Clyde. Tim, mm -hmm. glad Thank you. Here. Before we get into the content of our show, I thought we'd just take a few minutes to let you introduce yourself to our listeners and viewers beyond my brief uh, biography. So, Father Clyde, why don't you get us started? <coughs> I am a uh, Louisville native, a West Ender. Okay. Uh, and when I <coughs> grew up, I, I thought, you know, of course, Louisville is a very heavily Catholic city for a southern city. And I just thought everybody was Catholic. Yeah. I mean, in the <laughs> West End, we had 15 parishes at that time <coughs> and uh, four Catholic hospitals you know, three Catholic colleges, so I just assumed everybody was Catholic. Uh, and then, so I, I was uh, fortunately uh, got good good vibes from the uh, priests and nuns around us. And uh, <clears throat> so in the back of my mind, I, I thought about maybe being one of those kind of people. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so then I got into the academic world, went to St. X, went to Bellarmine, uh, went off, I had a couple of... Uh, fellowships and went to Fordham and got the PhD and then I started talking to the archdiocese and uh, <clears throat> they sent me for some study at St. Meinrad and I got ordained and then basically stayed at Bellarmine the rest of my career. Yeah. How, why teaching as a priest? That's a different role than we see a lot to these days. Well, it used to be a lot more common in the archdiocese <clears throat> because we had various high schools here as well as the college. Uh, but it's it's an ancient tradition going back to the, uh, the people like uh, Thomas Aquinas and you know the religious orders saw it as a particular way of developing the faith and spreading the faith, and so there it was. There it was. That's great. Great. Yeah. Now, well, that's that's what your people think of you a lot as as Father Clyde Cruz. Bellerman. That's oh. all, it's all in one <laughs> sentence sometimes. You. But we're we're glad you're a priest of our local diocese and you've been part of many things and Thank we're grateful for that. History. Thank you, Brian. Tim, how about you? I know you have a different different paths you took before you ended up in archive work. I knew you as a banker once even. Yeah. So tell yeah. us a little bit about your background. Um, I, I like to call myself a native Kentuckianian. Um, <laughs> okay. uh, born in Louisville, uh, St. Anthony's Hospital, uh, but always lived in southern Indiana and raised there. Um, went to Catholic sc grade school there, high school uh, in Langsville, then made my way uh, to college uh, locally with IU Southeast. Uh, which led me actually to the cathedral. Um, uh, I completed an internship at the cathedral uh, in those days and uh, then went on uh, for many years in the, a nonprofit career, uh, but always stayed involved uh, at the cathedral and the archives. And um, I like to say I have come full circle. <laughs> okay. You know, you're, you're, you, you have brought something we just didn't have, someone who's paying attention to it every day, and that's been a, that's been a real gift for I us. I love it. I so love it. We're, we're real glad you're here for that. I know Father Clyde is <laughs> yeah. appreciative to have somebody that's paying attention to this. As Amen. Of, uh, 
Okay, we'd like to explore some interesting <clears throat> parts of our stories of our history. Is how I thought we'd approach this today. Um, the Archdiocese has been around for 215 years, um, and we can talk about initiatives over those years. We could talk about things with the archives, but actually, uh, as Father Clyde, you'll get us started here. The founding of the diocese was 1808. But our history goes back before that, obviously, to 1775. Sometimes people use other years, all those kinds of things. I thought you could share some insights <clears throat> with us about the people of the diocese um, in those early centuries. We're, we're going to divide it up into some categories. But we'll take each century at a time, perhaps. Uh, and then, then, then um, uh, we'll also get a chance in between to talk to Tim about not just items that you've discovered and stories and uh, archival uh materials from those eras, but just what you learn being an, an archivist here. So um, we'll try to intersperse your stories, Father Clyde's uh, description of the of the eras and so forth, but let's get started. Father Clyde, okay, help us with, what can you tell us about the early earliest years of our diocese, uh, Kentucky Catholics and their leaders uh, in the 18th century? It, <clears throat> pardon me, it is really a remarkable story, and I don't know if most people here are aware just how remarkable it is. Uh, we were the first major uh, Catholic communities off the coast. Uh, and uh, so, that, you know, in, in the very beginning, American Catholicism was a very, very small factor. Uh, only about 1% of, when, at the time of the revolution, about 1% of the country was Catholic. <clears throat> and until about 1840, most Catholics in America lived south of the Mason-Dixon line, and that surprises people. Uh, of course, the, <clears throat> what is often called the Catholic colony was Maryland. And in Maryland, when the soil began to give, it, give out in places, they looked west into the new lands of Kentucky, which was then part of Virginia. And so we got groups, or what they called leagues, of people that came here, which meant that our beginning of Catholicism in Kentucky, and this made it distinctive too, uh, it was lay-led. They were mostly lay people that came here. They sustained the faith uh, by uh, bl blessing their children at night, by reading their prayer books every day, and <clears throat> um, they would get the occasional priest coming through usually going somewhere else. Uh, and it wasn't until about <clears throat> 1805 that the first stable priest that was staying here arrived, uh, Father Baden. And then uh, Narinx came the same year. And uh, so it's only then they began to have regular priests to serve them. And so they had a long tradition over a generation of being kind of lay-led and... Um, uh, kind of independent. And so they, you know, sometimes you'd, you'd hear people say, oh, the Catholics are, you know, priest ridden and they'll do whatever the priest tells them. They should read the letters and the people of <laughs> early Kentucky. Uh, and uh, they weren't going to take, settle for a whole lot. They were going to know how to question and, and so on. Uh, so th that, that was the early situation. And then uh, when the Pope, uh, Pius VII, uh, divided up the American church in the beginning with the Constitution, uh, the entire church was the Archdiocese of Baltimore, the entire country. And then in 1808, as you mentioned, Brian, they divided it into four dioceses, which still sound funny today, New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Bardstown, Kentucky. And Bardstown <clears throat> was took in an immense area. It was larger than France itself. And to that uh, the, the, the beginning, uh, the, the Pope assigned uh, Benedict Joseph Flaget, who was then 45 years old. He was a college professor, and uh, he didn't want to be Bishop of Kentucky, who would? I mean, <laughs> I mean, whoever was going to be was going to have to live in the saddle, uh, going from station to station, off in people's homes. And um, so it took him three years to get here. And, uh, you know, it, he had to help, they had to help raise money to get him here and so forth. 
But once he got here, <clears throat> there was this explosion of institutions, and before you knew it, they had three Catholic colleges. They had, uh, that was for the guys, they had um, several academies for young ladies. They had three sisterhoods. Uh, they had a seminary, the, all these the first of the Western country. When I say Western country, off the East Coast. So this was the first uh, inland diocese, and they had this um, large grouping of institutions, uh, pretty much the first off the coast. Let me ask you a question about that, because I, I, I have heard, I didn't have the, the uh, honor of being a student of yours, but I have heard uh, lines people say like there was more Catholics in Bardstown at that time than there were in New York City. Now, I don't know whether that's true. People say things like that because there was this feeling of this is the whole, the whole Catholic colony almost there too yeah, in the I, Bardstown area. I, I don't know the exact stats, but uh, there's something to that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, DR, for example, we had the Catholic colleges here, three Catholic colleges, and New York, they, the entire Northeast of the United States didn't get a Catholic college until uh, Fordham came along, which was my alma mater. And uh, it was, you know, kind of, when you think about that, uh, New York City only had one parish uh, and when it, at the time of the Revolution. And so... It was, we were competitive. Sure, sure. And so other than what was going on in Baltimore, the action was going on in Bardstown, and then it moved to Louisville in 1841. You know, the, the, the history of being founded by essentially lay settlers yeah. is unique, because most of the time you hear about dioceses and churches being founded by missionary priests on the West Coast, the Franciscans, and different groups like that. It is such an interesting... It's still in our blood today. There's a lot of lay leadership here today. Yeah. That's a, another day's topic, but it's it, it's part of our DNA, I think, sometimes here. Well, the um, you know the, the parishes in, in the West were founded by the Franciscans and the missions yeah. along the coast. And in the East, there were Jesuits, Later suppressed by one of the popes, but you know they were Jesuits, uh, and so there was a priest founded. Yeah. But here they were basically lay founded, yeah, yeah, and uh, that marked them, I think. Tim, let's turn to you a little bit now. So you joined the archives in 2019 as first full-time archivist. Um, of course, um, we have to acknowledge Father Dale Cieslik, who for 25 years served as both a pastor and a part-time archivist for us which was certainly helpful in, in carving the way for you, but, but you were able to come in, and, and I know um, uh, uh, Father Dale has become historic, historian, kind of succeeding Father Clyde, but you're now leading what is uh, a unique ministry as archivist. Can you tell us a little bit about, first, what is an archive and what is an archivist, and then we'll talk about some stuff. Sure, thank you. Uh, the archives uh, was formed to collect preserve and maintain the papers and artifacts of the bishops, the archbishops, the parishes, clergy, and institutions. Um, it's established in accordance with the Canon Law 482, which pretty much says the chancellor, yourself, uh, is to establish an archives to preserve uh, the material. Uh, so that's a, a sterile uh, reply, uh, <laughs> but uh, the uh, the list of what an archivist does uh, continues to grow, uh, but it all centers around collecting, preserving, and maintaining. Yeah, I love calling you and say, Tim, can you do this too? And the answer is almost always yes. <laughs> it, it keeps the day very interesting. <laughs> very good. Now, um, uh, how to, tell us about the relationship between archive and ar archives and the parishes. Well, the archives can serve... Uh, uh, to be many uh, very helpful for parishes in many ways. Um, uh, most often I receive calls from parishes celebrating an anniversary. They need to confirm their dates. A lot of times I'll get uh, requests for listings of pastors, things of that nature. Uh, we also uh, have a service in, in our archives where we um, store surplus inventory and uh, from other parishes that are cleaning out an area 
and then I receive requests from other parishes that need materials, and they'll okay. contact me. Now you got to explain what is surplus inventory. Well, uh, it the list is long, but it could be anything from uh, liturgical vessels. Uh, liturgical furniture. Uh, just the other day, uh, I gave a set of Stations of the Cross to a school. Um, I've got a request right now uh, for a chalice and patent for one of our parishes in the um, southern part of the state. And, um, and so it's anything, really. Um, uh, it's a lot of vestments, um, uh, liturgical vessels, things of that nature. Where do you get these things from? Uh, they can come from anywhere. Um, uh, one parish may have too many of one item, uh, or um, just individuals may have collected items. Either they had a relative that was uh, a religious or a clergy, or they've collected them from here, there, and everywhere. And as time goes on, they want to make sure that these uh, materials are uh, rehomed in a proper manner, so they'll contact us. Very good. Okay. Father Clyde, let's go to the, back to our history lesson a little bit. <laughs> go, to, go to the 19th century, perhaps, now. we got the 1800s now. What about what's going on now? <clears throat> well, in the 19th century, well, first of all, you, you start off with that amazing, what I call the burst of energy from 1810 forward. Uh, and then it becomes a very cosmopolitan, kind of metropolitan. They moved to Louisville in 1841. It's clear by that time that the city on the river, this is the age of the steamboat. And so the Louisville is going to be the, the, the main uh, urban area. So they moved the diocese there in 1841. And it's kind of amusing to me that a flash, just like he didn't want to come to Bardstown, he didn't want to leave Bardstown. And um, of course, the people at Bardstown were very angry that they were moving things to Louisville. So he came up with this I think very charming uh, letter he wrote to the people of Bardstown, and he said, "You know, it's <clears throat> it's almost biblical that in the beginning Jesus was born in a small town uh, in Bethlehem, and then he went to the big city Jerusalem for when important things to happen." He said, "So we have to do that too. We have to start in a small town and move to the bigger city." That didn't make them happy no, at all. Not. <laughs> no. And then he, what he also did was uh, he took his his best preacher he had was Martin John Spalding, who later was Bishop of Louisville and then later Archbishop of Baltimore. But he moved him to uh, Bardstown so he would have the cathedral, the proto-cathedral in Bardstown. And try to make people happier that way. So then we move into the 19th century, but in the mid-century, uh, that, that'd be the, the first big thing, I think, is that this growth, which is extraordinary. Uh, but then the, the problems start to amount. And in the 1840s in particular, Irish and Germans are moving into the area. Uh, they're f flooding in from overseas. And a lot of people get nervous with uh, what they consider these strangers. And, the, uh, and a lot of old anti-Catholic prejudice kicks in. And so a group called the Know Nothings uh, become a very large power, in this, certainly in this part of the country, as well as in the East Coast. And um, so we have the, the riot in uh, 1855 called Bloody Monday, in which uh, the usual figure given is that 22 people were killed in the rioting in Louisville, <clears throat> in that, uh, that melee. Uh, and part of what's remarkable about it is when it happens, it was a voting day, and, and the, uh, the no lessons were in charge, and they tried to keep the Catholics from voting, and that didn't set too well. Uh, but then... Uh, Afterwards, a lot of Catholics moved out of Louisville. A lot who were going to come here did not come here. And they think that might have eclipsed the population of Louisville in the 1850s so that other cities like St. Louis and ultimately Chicago, Cincinnati, got more of a Catholic population than they would have. So that marked uh, really, in a way, the second half of the century— that sense of the Catholics feeling like they had to prove themselves so that when World War I happens, they feel like they have to march to the colors in a very 
uh, obvious way. Uh, they and so they are proving themselves all the time, and so that that becomes a. Uh, I'm, I'm just told when 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 I did archiving, <laughs> when it was very low key stuff, uh, but I remember talking to a very old lady, and she said, "Well, it used to be <clears throat> when." Uh, we weren't acting well enough in the parish. We weren't turning in our money from the socials quickly enough. We weren't, you know, doing all that. We weren't working hard enough in the uh, the, the wheels and the socials. The pastor would come by and say, "Remember Bloody Monday? Oh, remember no. remember what they did to us?" <laughs> oh you know? dear! And so that became an encouragement. Yeah. Uh, so it it lingered in the popular imagination for a very long time. Yeah. Oh, my goodness sakes, that, that, that marked event, yeah, yeah, very significant. Tim, uh, obviously you have <clears throat> materials from that era in the archives, but, but more than just the materials, what, what have you seen, and, and I've done this for four years now, what have you seen has been the accomplishments, the, the, uh, the, I guess the developments of an archive? You have so many elements of it now that weren't there. Right. Um, well, one of the, the first projects I worked on when I came in 2019 was the completion of a project I'd already been working on, was the conservation of a large painting uh, owned by the Archdiocese by a Kentucky artist, Matthew Harris Jewett, and it was uh, called The Three Marys. Uh, the painting had uh, deteriorated and needed restoration, so we worked with the Cleveland firm, ICA, to um, bring it back to life, uh, and we've now uh, gifted it to the public. It's um, on view at the Speed Art Museum now, so uh, it, it's a large painting, uh, 11 feet wide by 9 feet tall, so it was no small task. Yeah. Uh, in the archives, uh, we're always thinking of ways to improve our best practices. Uh, I've joined a group called uh, ACTA, uh, Association of Catholic Diocesan Archivists, and uh, it's a group of like-minded individuals uh, in uh, other dioceses, uh, colleagues uh, in the archival field, and we're always working together to uh, improve our, our practices and see uh, how can we do things better. Um, here uh, at the Pastoral Center, uh, we've completed what I call the history hallway. Yeah. Um, uh, it's just a, a touch of our history uh, that people can view, uh, uh, a viewing of, of framings of all the bishops, uh, I say our two cathedrals, our current cathedral in Louisville, the proto-cathedral in uh, uh, Bardstown, the Basilica, and then other uh, uh, vignettes of interest. Uh, we've also got uh, a couple new uh, display cabinets uh, there on the second floor landing uh, that kind of touch on some uh, of the favorite archives. Now, uh, I, Father Clyde can answer the same question. I'm going to ask you first, and then he can think if he has one. When you go to work and you see things in the archive, do you have any item that that's the most special one to me? Well, they're they're all very special of course to me. Are, but I, want to know, I want to know the most special one. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm very fond of paintings okay. um, uh, and the conservation of paintings. Uh, we've been gifted uh, with a lot of uh, I call it Catholic material culture, mm -hmm. uh, and it's our responsibility to care for it. Uh, our early uh, bishops had a lot of portraits made, and uh, those need to be cared for, and things around that nature. Um, but of course, anything to do with our, our early faith, uh, a lot of things get lost over the years, so it's amazing what has come back to us. Yeah. And so it's those rare items that we're always looking out for, and those are the, uh, the gems. Father Clyde, that's a surprise question to you. Uh, anything you anything you remember from the archive work that you said? There certainly, yeah. certainly is. What I want to put in two plugs. One is to say for myself as a historian uh, how helpful it is to have a professional uh, you know, like Tim and uh, like uh, Father Dale who has done so much. And going back to uh, the, the first historian we had was uh, a man from... Um, of, of Father uh, Johnny uh, and Father John was uh, just a, a great fellow, he, grouchy but very you know heart of gold. <laughs> uh, I'd go in when I, I started this work in the early 1970s. I'd go to his place. Uh, I'm sorry, Lyons was his last name, John Lyons, 
And I'd, I'd go to uh, his door, and he'd say, "Yeah, come in, come in. You want a beer?" <laughs> this was nine o'clock in the morning. He said, "No, Father, thank you very much." So, so anyway, that that's that's one tip, and, and uh, very sincerely, uh, it's, it's just you, you can't really do history unless you've got good archives. And so, second is I think we need to give a big big nod to the sisters of the of uh, the Kentucky diocese. Uh, we have the mo- several mother houses here, much more than most places have, and they've they've had professional archives for a long, long time. And at the Nazareth mother house, they have a letter from uh, Abraham Lincoln, which they keep in a vault, and the, but they're very proud to take it out and show it to you. And it says it's uh, 1865, and it says, "Let no deprivation be placed upon the properties of the Sisters of Charity." Of Nazareth, uh, because the uh, federal troops were coming in, and they were concerned that the property, they, they, you know, the soldiers wouldn't be too polite. They had a woman's college there, <clears throat> and um, so that just to see that is very special. And I remember one time, uh, the archivist um, showed it to me, and she said, "I bet you'd like to show that in an exhibit, wouldn't you?" And I said, "Well, yes." And she's, "You can't have it." <laughs> okay. So we know the sisters' favorite document, but but, but, but the sisters have some, uh, you know, very professionally uh, managed archives and uh, going back into the 19th century. So there are great allies in this. Yeah, that's very good. What a rich history. Okay, let's talk a little bit in our time about the 20th century, um, uh, maybe a story or two from the 20th century. Well, the 20th century, uh, we again, we, we continue a very um, kind of metropolitan story now. Uh, and Louisville was a city that just seemed to be blossoming with Catholic things. Uh, like I, I thought it was a, when when I was a kid, there were three Catholic supply houses and Southern Catholic. I thought, well, that makes sense. The whole South must be Catholic. <laughs> uh, but um, then, especially in the period after when we go through the flood in 1937, <coughs> pardon me, and um, then after World War II, this Again, uh, I, I keep using the word explosion, but about 30 parishes are built in the ring around suburban Louisville. Uh, and that was uh, an extraordinary undertaking. Uh, and we seem to have a large number of vocations, both of, uh, male and female in those years. Uh, so that coupled with two other components. One was we had here one of the best known Catholics in the United States, if not the world, and Thomas Merton, uh, who had a special affection for a Bellarmine because the, the priests who were running the place were friends of his. Uh, so the, the, the Merton sensibility kind of rubbed off on us. And then uh, the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and in those years of the Second Vatican Council, I think there were four uh, Louisville priests who were national presidents of various organizations, Catholic organizations around the country. So Louisville was exerting a, uh, an influence far beyond of what an inland city would be doing or a middle-sized city would be doing. So that, in the 20th century, I think, stands out as uh, that. And then putting the kind of icing on that cake was the cathedral, uh, and especially from the 1980s forward, uh, under uh, Father Ron Knott, became uh, one of the great cathedrals in the country. And uh, an ecumenical leader, uh, a leader for social needs in the immediate area. Um, And uh, that became kind of symbolic of uh, what, that Louisville was a real leader in Catholic America. You know, it's so interesting that for a diocese that's over 200 years old, you know, we've only had ten ordinaries. That's a, that's a very small number in 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 a in a, in a history that long. Yeah. There's several who were here for many decades, even that, and that's an unusual thing. So our our, our story is able to pinpoint some characters and people. I'm going to let you do one little question here. A character you wish who you did not meet. Okay. That you'd like to meet. easy. That's easy. Uh, In the uh, early uh, 20th century, uh, there was a pastor at the cathedral, uh, Boucher, Father Boucher, 
And uh, he died in 1903. As lo- any priest would be happy with this in his biography. Uh, he died on Easter morning, kneeling next to his bed in prayer. Oh. They found him. But Boucher was a linguist. Uh, he had a long history in France before he came to this country. Uh, Boucher's uh, best friend was the uh, chief rabbi of Louisville. He was an ecumenical leader well before his time. He started in what I call the first spring of the cathedral, where they had schools for what they called boot blanks. They had schools for people who couldn't go to, to school during the day, working people. Uh, and the cathedral was a great social center uh, under his leadership. And, and he was there for like 40 or 50 years. And he went there. He was supposed to stay for the summer of 1860, and he was there until 1903. <laughs> I would really like to have met Boucher. Yeah, that's great. Yep. That's good. Tim, I'll give you just a couple minutes here. What, what, what's on the horizons for the archive now? <laughs> And I'm not asking you to do new budget, so tell me, what are you going to do here? <laughs> well, um, one of the things I'm working on uh, more of on a, a national scale, uh, I'm a member of a group called CROSS, and it stands for Catholic Research uh, Organization Study in Slavery. And so we are trying to find out ways how we can uh, better serve requests for uh, family information uh, with our archives. Uh, and so uh, a lot of my counterparts in other dioceses are all uh, experiencing the same thing. So we're looking for ways to do that. And we're having a conference this fall to talk about that. So that's uh, a, a big undertaking. The whole topic of the church relationship to slavery would be a whole other topic for another yes. show. That's an yes. important, important issue that we need to continue to study and face. Is there some archive item that's missing you wish you had besides yes. the Lincoln letter? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, sort of from that same time period. Photography in Louisville began in the 1840s. And in the back of my mind, I'm always wondering, is there a portrait, a, 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 an actual fo- a photo of Bishop Flaget? Ah, okay. um, we have several uh, paintings, portraits, painted portraits of him. But I'm always wondering, somewhere in a, um, an antique store or in a box in someone's attic, <laughs> is there an old tin type photo of Bishop Flaget? So I'm always looking for that. He's on the hunt. Any of our listeners know where that is? Please call Tim. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Hey, listen, Father Clyde, Tim, thank you for your contributions to our history in the past, but preserving our history for the future. You're full of great stories. We could talk about these stories. It's not we're talking about the 21st century. We're very we're just into it here too. But we'll come back in the next 50 years and we'll do this again and learn, learn some more lessons. You know, um, uh, you both have you both have reminded us that as a church. We're, we're not just a moment in time. It's a whole history us, of a community of people, and, and the stories and items and documents are all ways we connect ourselves with that whole rich story. So I thank you for what you've done in the past and in the present very much. Very good. And to our listeners and viewers, we thank you for joining us in this month's episode of What's New in Archlew. Join us again next month. We'll have a new series of visitors to be with us. Thank you. <laughs>